turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. One more time. We're going to look a little bit more at what it means to walk in a manner worthy of Christ, specifically the curriculum of this walk that we're pursuing with Christ. The curriculum is, drum roll, Jesus. It's Jesus himself. Ephesians 4, verse 17. Read this earlier, but I want to see, I want to show you how it climaxes. I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer, just as the Gentiles also live or walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding and excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But, but you did not learn Christ this way. If indeed you have heard him and been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. It was a cold morning in February of 2010. A man named Richard Code left a note on his landlady's door. This is what the note said. If I'm not back by Monday, please call the authorities. Along with the note was a set of GPS coordinates and a list of the supplies he had taken with him. However, as professional as this sounds, don't be fooled into thinking that Mr. Code was a survival expert. A little background, in the weeks and months leading up to this midwinter campout that he was planning in Muskoka, wilderness, the Muskoka wilderness of Canada, he had begun to follow a new cable television show called Survivor Man. The premise of the show is simple. Perhaps you've seen it. The host leads out, heads out into the wilderness and can demonstrate that being knowledgeable, he shows that if you're knowledgeable and prepared, it can actually save your life. It's a pretty cool show. I enjoyed watching it myself. Well, Richard Code was a big fan of Survivor Man. So he set out, sets out that morning and he felt certain that he could brave the elements applying what he had learned from watching the show. Four days later, his body was recovered by a helicopter in an area that was no longer accessible by foot because a blanket of heavy snowfall had covered the trail. The solar blanket he took with him didn't provide adequate warmth and he was unable to start a fire with the wet timber and he died, he succumbed to hypothermia. Richard Code was an enthusiast but he had little experience almost no training, and he set out to imitate, to emulate a professional who had all the advantages of years of instruction, years of practice, and found himself overcome by the cruel realities of climate. Now, this is a tragic story. It's awful. But I think it highlights a basic principle. Knowing about something doesn't mean you know how to do something. Seeing something done is a world away from doing it yourself. Enthusiasm only gets you so far. This thin emulation of Christ-likeness that so many wear is not the same as worshiping and walking in a worthy manner with Jesus. Attending church going to Bible studies, going to the youth ministry, downloading sermons, listening to Christian music, reading blogs, having believing friends. These things are wonderful, but they don't necessarily equip you to walk with Christ and to worship Jesus. Said another way, a zeal, a passion for the ideas and principles and the culture of Christianity does not equate to worshiping your Savior and walking in truth and in a way that pleases Him, a worthy manner. 
appreciating a well-crafted sermon, digging into a book, even being able to explain theological truth, memorize a passage of scripture, does not ensure that you're living it. Can I say it again? There is a world of difference between appreciation and application. Listen, beloved friends, life is too short. Eternity is too long to end up on the spiritual, as the spiritual equivalent of Richard Code, who knew a lot about something but didn't really have expertise in it. It's possible to know a lot about Christianity and to have very little true experience with the Savior. The text before us is a watershed passage. It's, it's definitive about our experience as believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's not too much to say that in the next few minutes of listening to Paul's words might be one of the most important verses and considerations you've ever had. That's not a statement because I'm preaching it. It's because of the power and the seismic nature of this passage you ever feel, uh, let me just be a little personal with you because I do, I know how this feels. Do you ever feel like you're in your faith, you're trying to get somewhere, but you're kind of running in water? You're just straining as much as you can, but you just don't feel like you're getting anywhere and you keep bobbing here and there and to and fro. And it feels like everybody else is just sprinting. They're not. But there are people, remember, pulling hard at the oars. This passage can free you up and focus your eyes on the satisfying path to spiritual maturity and spiritual satisfaction that is only, keyword only, only found in the living, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. In short, Paul directs our attention to the curriculum of Christianity and it's Jesus Christ himself. It's not a code of conduct. It's not a theological creed. It is the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ himself. So to sum up our conference, I wanna look with you at two aims, if you're following an outline, two aims of the curriculum of Christianity. Two aims of the curriculum of Christianity. The first is in verse 20. Number one, a decisive transformation from the past. A decisive transformation of the past. This is just a summary of what we did in our last session. And it comes in the two words, but you. But you. He talked about those who were living as the, the uh, Pharisaical uh, Judaizers did or code word for the Gentiles, unbelievers. He calls us to make a contrast with those who are walking like unbelievers. But you, you're different. But that is not the way you learn Christ in the ESV. Now, we looked at these verses last time, but let me remind you of what he describes in the way that an unbeliever thinks. And I, I'm gonna, I, we've covered it so many times this afternoon but, and this morning, but listen again because it's so important that you understand that the battleground for the Christian faith is between your ears. Verse 17 of chapter four. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you live, you walk, you, you, you move in your life no longer as unbelievers as the Gentiles also live or walk in the futility of their thinking, their mind being darkened in their understanding, another mind word excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance, not knowing, that's in them. That's another mind word because of the hardness of their heart. That's your mission control central, your thinking, your decision making, your mind. And consequently, they become callous, giving themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every imaginable kind of Impurity with greediness. Now, we noticed last time that this description of life before Christ is a description of life without Christ. It's important. You're, I know it's simple, but think with me. The life that you lived before coming to faith in Christ was a life that you had without Christ. 
Paul is clear of this, that this old way of thinking, this old way of living is to be abandoned. And the deeper dive he takes into that is in verses 22 and following. Let me just read verses 22 to 24. He says, in reference to your former manner of life, your unbelieving days, you lay aside that person, that old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And this is just a, this is for another sermon sometime. Uh, I'm, Andreas, I'm being presumptuous. Someday before I die, I wanna come back and talk about this. This is just incredible. Your lusts deceive you, they're liars. The lusts of your heart, the desires of your eyes, <laughs> They lie to you by telling you they will make you happy. They will satisfy you. They will keep you happy. Quench the thirst that you have for life. Lay it aside, it won't. It's a lie. It's a lie. And verse 23, that you be renewed. How? In the spirit of your thinking, of your mind. There it is again. You have to think rightly and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God. It looks like God looks. It acts like Christ acts. It's been crafted, created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. You will know that the truth is impacting your life when it creates righteousness and holiness in your life. It's not just a mental curiosity. It changes you. And again, that was our last session. This simple contrast here in the two words, but you, calls for a decisive transformation from the past when a person believes and receives the gospel. John Calvin says it like this. He whose life differs not from that of unbelievers has learned nothing of Christ. For the knowledge of Christ cannot be separated from the mortification or killing of the flesh, end quote. New Testament scholar Walter Layfield says this. The teaching is, in summary, that there should be a radical difference between pre- and post-conversion character. You're a different person. You're a new creature. Old things passed away. New things have come. This is a change from our old way of thinking. And it keeps us from drifting back, relapsing into that old way of thinking, which creates the old way of living. Now, that's all kind of review in the two words of but you. That's a decisive transformation from the past. Now we get into really the climax of the conference for this year. Number two. If you want to aim at the Christian at the curriculum of Christianity, a personal Engagement with Christ. I have waited all weekend to get here and ex been excited for months about this moment. Now, let me, uh, let me ask you a question and maybe I'm confessing here and I, 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 I'm gonna be embarrassed if I'm the only one and I might be. But have you, have you ever read a passage, if you've, especially if you've been in the church or the faith very long, have you ever read, ever read a passage and you read it and you, then, then you say something like, when did the Holy Spirit put that in the Bible? I have never seen that before. I've read that dozens of times and I've never seen that before. This, this was that passage for me. It's nuclear. It's incredible. It is literally life changing he says but you did not learn Christ in this way <laughs> time out whoa wait wait time that's, that doesn't make sense doesn't make any sense notice the uniqueness of what Paul is saying and how he says it Peter O'Brien, New Testament scholar, says this. this is, these are cool words. Listen to this. The first formulation of you did not learn Christ in this way is without parallel. 
The phrase to learn a person appears nowhere else in the Greek Bible. And to date, it has not been traced to any pre-biblical Greek document, end quote. What he's saying is, this is an incredibly unique statement. Game changer, watershed, pivotal. And the reason is that the grammar in English and in Greek and in Russian makes no sense. It's really bad English, really bad Greek. It's really bad grammar. Sometimes bad grammar makes really good theology. You expect him to say something like this, a verb or a participle, like, but you did not learn to follow Christ this way. He didn't say that. You might expect him to say, you did not learn to serve Christ, but he doesn't say it that way. He doesn't say, but you did not learn to worship Christ or even you did not learn to believe in Christ. He says, you did not learn Christ in this way. Now, does that remind you of another passage that has really bad grammar and really good theology? Philippians 1, 21, Paul says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't he say, for to me is to follow Christ or to love Christ or to serve Christ, to worship Christ, believe in Christ. No, no, for me to live is Christ. But you did not learn Christ in this way. I think Paul sums this up over in Colossians chapter three. Listen to how this verse climaxes, this passage climaxes. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, you believe the gospel and been resurrected into newness of life with him, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. He's seated at the right hand of God. Set your, <laughs> there it is again. Set your mind, your mental, it's, this is mental, it's rational. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And listen to this. When Christ, who is our life? Not who gave us life, who is, who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Christ is our life. You learn Christ. To live is Christ. Paul is saying that Jesus himself is the content of what the readers have learned. What does this mean? Well, his parallel to this is in Colossians 2, 6 and 7, where he says, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk there's our verb, live in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him, established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. He's saying Jesus himself was the subject of the apostolic preaching and teaching. And this is consistent with all of the New Testament. Can I take you on a quick tour? Just a quick tour. Just so you know that these aren't outlier verses. 1 Corinthians 1.23 but we preach Christ crucified. That's our message. Our message is a person. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Now, if Christ is preached, that he's being raised from the dead, then how do you say there's no resurrection? 2 Corinthians 1, 19. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, 2 Corinthians 4, 5. We do not preach ourselves, but we preach Christ Jesus as Lord. Acts 5, 42. Every day in the temple, from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And then one of my life verses, Colossians 1, 28. Him we proclaim. We proclaim 
him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that every man, we may present every man complete in Christ. How important was that to Paul? For this purpose also, I kapiao, I work to wearisome effort, work to exhaustion. I striving according to his power, agonizomai, I agonize. But it's all according to his power, which mightily works within me. So let's draw back and con- make some conclusions on this. The content of Paul's message was the person of Jesus from beginning to end. His proclamation was permeated and saturated with love and wonder and commitment and obedience to Jesus himself. So let's talk about the big problem, can we? This is a big problem that I struggle with for most of my life. In fact, the, the, the book that I wrote back in 2011 on uneclipsing the sun was me solving, letting the scripture solve for me this problem. And that was, it's so easy to kind of reduce our faith to a system of behavior modification. Doing better, trying harder, being gooder. Or a list of things we believe. Those are important. Behavior modification is important. Doctrinal foundations to believe are important. But they cannot, here's the, here's the key to the whole weekend, ready? They cannot be separated from the living, resurrected worship and walk with Christ, with Jesus. Or you will be forever trapped in what I would call enoughism. You know what enoughism is? Here's enoughism. Satan just so good by teaching us what enoughism is. You think this, well, I'm not sure. I, I, it robs you of assurance. I'm not sure if I'm saved. I don't pray enough. I'm not sure if I'm converted. I don't obey enough. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm truly, genuinely a follower of God. I don't give to the church enough. I don't honor Christ with my attendance enough. I don't fast enough. I don't, you fill in the verb, enough. And here's the secret. <laughs> You're right. You're completely right. You cannot obey enough. You will not pray enough to ever make God say, that's enough. Because God, here's a little um, tidbit for your theology. You know what it takes to go to heaven? You gotta be perfect. Sinless. Anybody qualified? I'll wait for you to raise your hand. No. So if this is the good news. This is the good news of the gospel. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he had lived the imperfect life of a sinner who would believe in him. He killed him. He crucified him on a cross. Isaiah 53, it pleased the father to crush the son so that he could treat you in heaven as if you had lived his perfect life. That's called imputation. He imputes Christ's righteousness to your account and takes your sinfulness and places it on Christ on the cross. And he dies for our sins. No, we can't ever be perfect to go to heaven, but one could. There is one who did. There is one who lived a perfect life. And by faith, if we believe that he is our Lord and Savior, he grants to us, he imputes to us his righteousness. Now, if you're like my 12-year-old son, when I was explaining this to him many years ago, he said, Dad, that's just not fair. I mean, we get Christ's righteousness, he gets our sin. That's not fair to Jesus. And I remember saying, you're right, but it's loving. That's love. Don't be trapped by enoughism. Be sure that all of these are indeed taught in Scripture. You need to pray. You need to obey. You need to worship. But there's no threshold you'll ever cross where God says, made it. 
Finish line crossed. You're in. No. He gives us a savior who died for us and gives us his righteousness. Therefore, salvation is all designed to change a person's heart to learn and love Jesus. Now, a little footnote. Christ who is our life. Learning Christ. For me to live is Christ. You understand that all of those demand a belief in the resurrection, that Jesus is alive. Let me ask you the most important question that you can ever answer. You ready for this? This is, I get this from 1 Corinthians 15. Where are the bones of Jesus? I saw a documentary a few years ago in an ossuary, a little bone box that they found. Supposedly it said Jesus, a son of Joseph, and there was some bones in there. And they said, oh, there's proof that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. That's him. Come on. Come on. That's like saying, we found a grave that said, Joe, son of David, is, um, uh, 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 is in this grave. So that's the only Joe and the only David who ever lived. That's ridiculous. I can tell you where the bones of Jesus are. I know. They're in his resurrected body sitting at the right hand of God. That's where they are. Do you believe that? Do you believe in the resurrection? We do this on Easter every Sunday at our church. I wish we did it every Sunday. Let's, let's have a little practice. Let's see who knows it. I know, I know Dave knows it. Jesus Christ is risen. Yes, yes, I can go home now. This is good. He is risen indeed. Do you believe that? That's a great saying. If he is alive, that's a game changer. He is there. He knows. He cares. He's able to support you. He loves you. He sees you. He knows you. He promised to never forsake you. He's with you always, even to the end of the age. That's why Paul said our message is a person. It's the living, resurrected Lord. Not a new message from Paul. Listen to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come to you with superiority of speech or of wisdom. I didn't come to you with flashy sermons, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of of men, but on the power of God. Similarly, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17, we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, we really believe this, as from God, we speak Christ in the sight of God. Of God. He's alive. He's alive. So, what do we do? How practical can we be? Listen to the words of the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 12. Listen to the focus. Therefore, Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance, the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here's the key phrase. Fixing, focusing, planting our eyes on Jesus. That means he's not in the grave. He's able to have our eyes fixed on him. These are the eyes of faith. He's the author and perfecter. Some people read it a little wrong, of, not of our faith, but of faith in general. He is the one who we believe in by faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is alive. He is real. Now, I don't want to be silly But I believe that Jesus in his resurrected body is somewhere right now. And I don't don't know where that is. 
I'm not being trite. I'm not being silly. I don't know if you go to Jupiter or Saturn and take three light years to the right. I don't know where that is. But he said in Acts 1, I'm going to come in the same way I left in my resurrected body. Are you fixing your eyes on Jesus? Let me tell you, my frustration that I shared with you a minute ago that I wrestled with for many decades in my Christian walk was that I, I really was trying hard to be better, to do things that I thought would, would ultimately earn favor with God instead of realizing that he had done it for me in Christ. Jesus is our message. He is who we proclaim as opposed to what we might proclaim. Jesus does not only provide salvation, so important, he is our salvation. And by the way, those of you who are in ministry or thinking about ministry, if we don't communicate the right message, Christ, we will create the wrong allegiance. If Christ is not who we're preaching, and if we're only preaching behavior modification, then people will be drawn to try to change their behavior. But if we preach Christ, they'll be drawn to worship an amazing, an amazing Savior. Jesus Christ is the most amazing person to ever live. The question is, are you amazed? So how can we practically equip ourselves to proclaim him, to love him? Well, let me give you some suggestions, okay? Let's make this really practical. Learn, his, learn and study and memorize the truth about his deity. Focus on the fact that he is not just, just a man. He is God in flesh. The true and living God. Look at his character. You know, you probably too young, but when, there was a craze many years ago, the WWJD bracelet, people would wear these bracelets, what would Jesus do? And I used to think, oh, that's, that's actually a pretty good idea. If I did what Jesus did, if I imitated his character, Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. What would Jesus do is a great question. His claims about heaven and hell about his kingdom, about earth, about the present, about the future, his teachings, his miracles, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, his responses to life, his responses to death, his grace, his influence, his virgin birth, his all-fulfilling satisfaction, his good news that is all about him and through him and for him. You ever thought about this? Every other person that you ever look at or get to know or study in your whole life, every person that you'll ever appreciate or know in this life, <laughs> hope I don't disappoint anyone, but the closer you get to them, the more flaws you see. I mean, except Kim who married me. I mean, that's, a, that's an exception, but um, no, ask her. It's, she sees many, many flaws. But that's not the case with Christ. The closer you get, the more you see. He gets better. John seventeen three. Another really important pendulum verse Jesus is um, probably just outside the garden of Gethsemane he's having his last conversation with the disciples before he takes Peter James and John goes further in and then a little further in and has his suffering his passion where he pours out his heart and says Lord if there's any other way take this cup from me and he says not my, my will but yours be done at the beginning of that, he prays. And this is a, I'm going to be honest, this is, this is a little weird. I hate to use that word, but it's, it's a little weird. Because Jesus prays in the third person. 
It's the only place in the scripture in the New Testament where he prays in third person. You say, what does that mean? Imagine if I got up, I walk up the stage. This is just, just see how weird this is. I walk up and I say, hey, let's pray for, for this sermon. And I say, uh, Lord, we ask that you give Rick Holland uh, your, your encouragement as he talks to these, these precious souls about your word. You would go, you'd probably look up and go, did he just pray for himself by calling himself Rick Holland? <laughs> That's what Jesus does. This is eternal life. Now, let's stop right there because most of us don't understand what is eternal life. We think eternal forever, life living. Eternal life is living forever and you will be partly right, just not completely. Jesus defines eternal life for us here. Listen to what he says. This is eternal life that they may know you, he's praying to God, the only true God And here's the third person, and they may know Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus doesn't just provide eternal life. He is, he is eternal life. He's the substance of our life. Christ who is our life, Colossians 3, 4 says. To live as Christ, Philippians 1. 121. Here in our verse, you did not learn Christ. Have you learned Christ? Now he goes on to tell us the details. We're going to be very fast here of what a personal engagement with Christ means. His little sub outline, letter A. Christ is the initiation into salvation. He's the initiation into salvation. If indeed you have heard him, that's how you got in. You heard him. Not just about him, but you heard him. He's the substance. What does this mean? It means that we have heard about the gospel, which was about Jesus of Nazareth. And the assumption was that hearing accurately about him was hearing directly from him. And the point Paul is making is hearing about and hearing from the person of Christ was their initiation into faith. Remember Colossians 1.28, we proclaim him. Christ is our message. Christ is our salvation. Letter B, Christ is our continuation, not just our initiation, but our continuation in salvation. Look at verse 21. And have been taught in him. This phrase speaks of how the Ephesians had grown in their faith. It was by learning and maturing in their theology as it coalesced about and around Jesus. In him, that word, little phrase, in him is a favorite phrase of Paul in his epistles. It means in fellowship with him. Listen to what he said earlier in Ephesians 2, verse 12. Remember that you were at that time in your pre-Christian state, separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you were brought near by his death, by his blood. Paul informs us that our lives are to evidence our union with Christ in holiness and obedience to him. This happens, by the way, in the context best, in the context of your local church. You say, well, that's weird. That's kind of heavy. No, 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 it's not. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Jesus said, take my yoke. You know what a yoke was? Some of you who have farms may know what a yoke is. A yoke was a a log or a piece of wood that was carved out with two arches in it. And you put it over two cattle, two cows uh, that that would pull a cart. And they had to be equally yoked. You couldn't put like a cow and a goat. That wouldn't go very well. So when he says, you know, in 2 Corinthians, don't be unequally yoked. That's what he's talking about. But he says, don't, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm going to sit in that yoke equally with you. What a blessing. Learn from me. For I am gentle, humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It's him. Let her see. Christ is the integrating centrality of salvation. Also in verse 21, just as truth is in Jesus. Unfortunately, it's easy to make a good theological point 
with unintended misleading implications. We often do this as Christians when we speak of the truth as an abstraction. In other words, we point to the thing of our faith and sometimes the things we wanna know and want to believe rather than those things all have to do with truth about and in the person of Christ, in Jesus. He speaks of truth several times in Ephesians chapter one, verse 13, in him, You also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, the message of truth was in him. Ephesians 4, 25, put on a new self, read it a minute ago, in the likeness of God, created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Ephesians 5, 9, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. That's the life that he gives us, it's truth. Ephesians 6, 14, gird your, 14 rather, gird your loins with truth. And this truth understood and defined is understood and defined rather by what we know to be true about Jesus. If you're curious, this place in Ephesians where he calls Jesus by Jesus, not the Lord, not the Lord Jesus, not the Lord Jesus Christ is the only place in Ephesians he uses the name by itself, Jesus. Truth is in Jesus. Walter Layfield writes, to express it in retrospect from the perspective of the church, the central truth of Christianity does not reside mainly in its creeds or sacraments, but in Jesus himself so can we just kind of pull our thoughts together is it possible that maybe the reason that some of you are struggling in your walk with Christ is that it's not so much a walk with Christ? Is he the object of your faith? The desire of your heart? The peace of your soul? The one you look forward to seeing? Is heaven attractive because you see Jesus there face to face Thomas Vincent the Puritan said this if you would aim if you would attain this love unto Jesus whom you have never seen you must get to a thorough persuasion listen that there is such a person as Jesus Christ and that he is such a person indeed as the scriptures has, have revealed him to be. So, I mean, do you believe that he's alive and that he's defined by this book? The reason why heathens and infidels, unbelievers, are without love to Christ is because they've never heard of him. And the reason many nominal Christians, immature Christians or Christians in name only, have heard of Christ or without love for him is because they have not they are not really persuaded that there is or ever was such a person as Jesus Christ in the world. If you would attain this love, you must first give firm assent to this truth, which is the greatest of all and the very pillar and foundation of the whole Christian religion, that Christ really is and the history of him is no cunningly devised fable. It's about him. The simple point is that Christianity is about Jesus Christ. I feel silly saying that. That's the most profound sentence you could believe. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Philippians 1, 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ 
lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, listen, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, who gave himself up for me. 2 Corinthians 5.15, he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Do you love Jesus because you believe that he's a resurrected Savior who's alive? Can, I just, can you take it from a man with gray hair? I spent a lot of time trying to be happy and satisfied in my Christianity by doing and trying harder. And doing and trying harder is fine. But I was missing the person of Christ. He was there and other things were eclipsing him. And I could see his brightness, the aura. But I was missing him. The point of this entire conference set of sermons is to say Jesus is the object of your faith. He is your savior. He is your master and Lord. He is worth any and every sacrifice. He gives happiness. He gives satisfaction. He gives hope for the most threatening thing you will ever endure, death. Why? Because he conquered death and offers resurrection hope for those who get trapped by its fear, as Hebrews 2 says, who are subject to slavery to the fear of death. It's a relationship you can develop, you can have with a Lord who knows you, who loves you. If you believe in him who, who died for you, he cares, he sees, he knows, he comes. When Jesus was having his crisis in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was all alone. And the Father sent an angel to comfort him. But when you and I struggle, he doesn't send an angel, he sends his son. But he doesn't send him in that moment. He was already there. He said to the disciples in the upper room, I won't leave you as an orphan. I will make my abode with you. And he said in his last great commission, lo, I am with you always, with you always. Anchor your faith in him and you will find satisfaction and rest for your souls he's the only hope and I pray that you have found him or that you might find him let's stand and pray Father forgive me for how often, even this week, I've thought about behaving, responding and acting in ways that were Christian, but did not have you as the focus. Thank you for the grace that even in these disobedience moments that you've never left me or forsaken me, that you're with us always to the end. Lord, transform hearts to abandon and neglect the endless treadmill of trying harder so that they're accepted by you and to find acceptance in the gift of your son for their sin and the joy of his presence for our life for our death, for all eternity. 
meet us in our greatest need, which is for you, be the satisfaction to our hunger and our thirst for all that our soul wants, we find in him. Bless this special group of young people who've assembled this weekend to think a little more deeply about the trajectory of their lives. Give them hope, give them anchor in the living, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ from Nazareth. We pray this because of our access to you through him. Amen.